Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and today we have Perry Marshall with us. Perry is one of the most expensive business strategists in the world. He's endorsed by Forbes and by Inc. Magazine and has authored eight books. At London's Royal Society, he announced the world's largest science research challenge, the $10 million Evolution 2.0 Prize. His reinvention of the Pareto Principle is published in Harvard Business Review, and his Google book laid the foundations for the $100 billion pay-per-click industry. Perry has a degree in engineering and lives with his family in Chicago. Perry, it's so great to have you on the show. Good to be here, Stefan. Thanks for having me. Of course. Well, thank you for... uh, coming back because you were on my other show, Marketing Speak, talking about pay-per-click and the Pareto principle and all that. That was a fabulous episode uh, a little while ago, maybe a year or two ago. So it's great to to have you back, but this time to go all metaphysical and, and talk about your newest book, which I have here in my hands, Memos from the Head Office. And the Head Office is where? I know the answer already, (laughs) but for our listener who is not familiar with your book, where's the head office? We felt like memos from the head office was a much more user-friendly and demilitarized zone term than how to hear from God or, you know, something, something that blatant. Um, And, and also, you know, giving people permission to not necessarily be quite sure where things come from, but switched on to your intuition, listening to your body. Um, And look, you and I are both business authors and we know there's a gazillion business strategy books. Here's how to do this and here's how to do that. They're, They're coming out of our ears. There's not a lot of books that talk about the fact that some of the best business strategies never came out of any book they landed on somebody like in a burst of inspiration. This happens a lot. And uh, I just don't think nearly enough attention is given to that. And we wanted to write a book about all the different people I've encountered who have a story like that, that often doesn't get told. Yeah. Very important. Very important because there's a lot of mystery and magic to this world, to the universe. And if we don't recognize it, then how do we appreciate it? And if we don't appreciate it, how do we get more of it? So right. it's really, really important. And, and understanding is part of the solution to success, but really wisdom is the end game, I would, I would view, because then you're tapping into something much greater than yourself rather than trying to figure it out on your own, doing the hard slog all by yourself. Yes, wisdom is knowing how to use knowledge, and there's not a formula. Like, knowledge does not teach you how to use knowledge. Like, it, knowledge only goes so far. And yeah. the, the people that probably you most admire, whether it's music or film or business or, or needlepoint and you know like whatever um they're not running on strict formulas um the 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 art is beyond that and well and i also think that a very large number of entrepreneurs truth be told are really artists i mean you they might they might not be painters or musicians or anything like that, but they, they approach their work the way artists approach their work. Um, there, there is that there is something very important, maybe even sacred about it. It needs to be done a certain way. It needs to be delivered a certain way. And a lot of times the business systems thinking doesn't catch that or doesn't respect it properly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one thing that is related to this concept is there's a difference between serendipity and synchronicity. And in my view, both are required in order to pull that rabbit out of your head if you're an entrepreneur and turn that into a patent, you know, an invention or a a new process or something revolutionary. Do you have any thoughts on, on the difference between the two? And if you, I only just recently understood what 
the differences myself just within the last couple of months. So I'm, I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are and I'll share w- what my, mine are as well based on, on the little bit of research I've done on it. They are two separate things. So synchronicity is when events and people align in remarkable ways that you couldn't have planned. Um, serendipity is actually quite different. It's, it's when an unexpected situation comes up, you could even call it an affordance, and you are already prepared to take advantage of that. And the difference between the two is that with serendipity, the preparation could have happened years ago, and you've just been carrying it all along. Um, it's like potential energy. Right. It, it was potential energy. It, it, it wasn't two fireworks going on at, off at the same time all by themselves. It was this firework went off and guess what? I can pull, I can pull this thing out of my bag and I can make this go off. Like I can shoot this rocket uh, two seconds later and, like, and, and it converges. Um, so yeah, those are two very different things. Um, and, but in order to actualize either one of those, your brain has to be switched on and you, you have to be in a receptive state. Um, and I, I don't think that the super formulaic version of the world um, conditions people to be receptive like that. Mm. And why do you think that is? I mean, there, I have my theories around uh, this and I'm, I'm curious what yours is. Why are people being kind of put to sleep or dumbed down by the structures in place in this world? Well, you know, I just had a conversation two hours ago with somebody. He was, he was talking about, um, he was talking about the CYA mentality. And he said, you know, the cover your ass mentality is I'm afraid of Roger because Roger is my boss. You know, I'm going to make sure that Roger can't yell at me. And so if, you know, if Roger wants a 10 page report, then I'm going to give him a 10 page report, even if we could have done it in four, right. And I, I'm going to dot the I's and cross the T's and it's, it, it's coming from a fear perspective and it's run by the lizard brain. Okay. And this is how most schools work. Okay. You're, you're motivated by fear of the F or the C or the D. Um, and you're expected to, to, to check the boxes. And so people get trained this is how you get the gold star. You just do this. Like I've had this conversation with my kids a whole bunch of times. I've said, especially in college, you're going to run in a lot of situations where you can decide, you have to decide, hey, I'm going to do this assignment. Do I want to learn something or do I want a good grade? I could get a good grade by doing stuff I already know and regurgitating it, giving them the right answer. If I learn something, I might make a mistake. Um, And so like the the straight A mentality and the perfectionism mentality. Well, as an entrepreneur, 80% of what I do doesn't work out the way I wanted it to and often fails. If you want a 100% success rate or 95% success rate, you can't take any risks you have to shoot fish in a barrel. And, and it, so if all you're gonna do when you go through your life is fish, uh, shoot fish in a barrel, um, you're, you're never gonna come up with anything genuinely breakthrough. And this is why a lot of professions are stuck. In fact, my experience from working in hundreds of industries is most industries, are 20 to 50 years behind state of the art. If now, if we're in technology or internet or something like that, okay, five or 10 years behind. 
but very few people are actually hugging the edge of the very best that we could be doing. There's lots of inertia. There's lots of resistance. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not as hard to be innovative as a lot of people think. In fact, a lot of times the difficulty is in when you are innovative, getting anybody to listen to you, getting anybody to accept what you're doing. Um, uh, so, well, yeah, let's bounce it back to you because. Yeah, so I'm, I, what comes to mind there is the Cassandra effect, right? So Cassandra, the Greek uh, myth of, of her where she was warning the uh, powers that be that uh, Troy was going to fall. Mm. And the curse was that she would be able to foretell the future, but no one would believe her. And of course, the Trojan horse and everything. And she warned everybody and nobody would listen. And mm. Mm. Troy fell. But, um, you know, if you come with such innovation and rule breaking, you're going to get uh, met with resistance. Yes. Yes. So I've been ahead of the curve long enough, like, you know, get pioneers come back with arrows in their backs. And I, I think there's a certain art that you learn mm. to like not pull all of your ideas out of the hat all at once, um, you know, figure out what's the next thing that I can get accepted right now. What's some component of that thing that even, even if people are resisting change, there's still something about this new thing that they don't want to live without. That, that does work. And I, I have a lot of friends and colleagues who, who do that. Um, I, I was talking to one friend of mine who's a scientist once, and I said, well, that's what you get for being 25 years ahead of your time. And his wife was in the kitchen. She looks over and she goes, 30. <laughs> <laughs> and so- uh, yeah, They yeah, get the arrows like, in the back and the second in the row, uh, they claim the prize. <laughs> Yeah, and and I think I think a lot of people listening to us can can identify with that. And like my my first sales job, I identified some technology that I just thought was really cool, um, and I started promoting it. But a the world just wasn't ready for that then, and so I was starving. And then b even worse, the company I worked for wasn't really equipped to support me the way that I needed them to if I was going to make a sale. And so what I was doing was doubly futile, um, which is really depressing. Of course, okay, I was only 27 years old and I knew even less than I thought I did. When I went to a new company, they were much better equipped to support me and they were much better equipped to sell to the early adopters they had a nationwide audience instead of just a Chicago metro area audience. And so there was, uh, if you could only sell to a small percentage of people, there was a much larger number of people to, to choose from. And so, yeah, when, when you're an innovator, um, it's, uh, I mean, people, people throw around words like innovation all the time. Most, most of them don't have any idea what you're talking about, frankly. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of serendipity and synchronicity in there that uh, people don't recognize or respect, really. Yeah. yeah. Um, I invented a uh, uh, software as a service back in 2003, <clears throat> and it was a whole lot of serendipity and, and synchronicity that made that product go. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a cost per click SEO platform. We used oh. a reverse proxy technology. And oh. <clears throat> I wrote, I wrote the original prototype myself, and then we hired a bunch of developers and we'd charge on a cost per click basis. And it was so much cheaper to pay our uh, CPCs versus uh, Google AdWords at the time that our, our clients were happy to have that performance-based model. And Bingo. It, yeah, yes. it, was, it was such a, uh, a game-changing and, and uh, destiny changing technology, that was why my company got acquired back in 2010, because that technology was driving the majority of our revenue instead of our agency services. 
And so that, that was um, serendipity in that stuff was uh, arriving at a time where I was prepared for it. I had figured out all sorts of uh, things around regular expression, pattern matching, and a lot of stuff around rewrite rules and, and proxies and stuff like that. And then when we were trying to work around an issue with one of our clients, um, it was, it was Cole's department stores and, uh, they <laughs> needed reassurance that we weren't going to destroy their site with SEO, uh, that SEO wasn't going to ruin their brand. And so I pulled their pages from their server with an automated script and then injected SEO goodness into them and presented them in real time. And I made mm -hmm. the whole site functional so they could click around and so forth. It was just a demo, but it was a functional demo. And then I realized after that, that, wait a second, we could do this in, in a production environment. So that Very was how, cool. how that came about. But um, yeah, another serendipitous uh, event or I guess you could also say it's synchronicity too, because we had another client a few months later, Northern Tool, couldn't hit their code freeze deadline in the traditional way by in, um, doing the SEO work to their site. And so I figured I could use the script that I had written for Coles in a production environment, and uh, they were game to give that a try. And so we were able to sneak that in before the code freeze in September. Uh, so yeah. That was uh, very serendipitous and very synchronous. Uh, so that was um, back in 2003. And I had no idea. I did not appreciate what was happening and how the universe was conspiring to make life work for me. I just thought I, I, I cut a good break. At the time, I did not. I was agnostic. I wasn't even um, really believing in a higher power at that point in my life. And that wasn't wow. until age 42 that I had my spiritual awakening in India. So, uh, <laughs> which brings me to my, my next question for you is what was your big memo from the head office that got you started in this, on this path? Uh, well, it was very big and it was in March of 2003. Um, I had read uh, maybe a month before Richard Kasha's 80-20 book and it set my mind on fire. And um, I realized when I read his book that, you know, he's describing this as a binary thing, that there's an 80 and there's a 20, but actually there, there should be some kind of a curve that would, it would be a, like a math formula for this. And I looked around and nothing that I found on the internet described what I was picturing in my mind. And so uh, one particular day, uh, it was March 23, 2003, I was trying to work on the math problem. And uh, I was stuck on it. And I'm an engineer by training, so it wouldn't be ridiculous for me to be doing something like this. Um, I was like, there's something really valuable here. What is it? And I was just grinding away. Um, and so all day I was obsessing about this. And the other thing I was obsessing about was uh, three days before I had had one of those, um, I think all successful entrepreneurs occasionally have these caveman discoverers fire moments where you did something and it made a bunch of money and you're like, whoa. And, and this had happened to me. And I was thinking, all right, I got, my brother-in-law has this project in Mozambique. Mozambique is the 18th poorest country in the world. They've got all kinds of diseases and problems and famine, and they have a church and a school and a feeding program. How could I use some of my newfound money skills to help that? And so I was thinking about my calculus problem in Mozambique all day long. And well, there was this music thing at church and I went to it and there must have been 30 people there and there were some musicians just playing this Pink Floyd kind of music on the stage. And, and I was in La La Land and I was a million miles away thinking about my math problem and I was thinking about Mozambique. And I look up and this woman is making a beeline for me 
I've never seen her before. She's black. I have no idea who she is. She sticks out her hand and she says, hi, my name is Vivian and the Lord gave me a word for you. Now, she said that and I thought, I've heard of things like this. The word is fractal, isn't it? <laughs> I've, I've never had this happen to me. I guess this is going to be interesting. And she goes, the Lord told me that you're very good at math and you're working on some kind of formula or equation or, or invention and you're going to figure it out. And I immediately started doing math in my head. And the math was, what are the chances that anybody in this room on a Friday night is working on a math problem at all? And what are the chances that she nailed the first person the first time? So she really had my attention. This is okay, this is weird. And then she turned to walk away and then she spun around and she goes, oh, and he told me something else too. You wanna support missions and God is gonna bless your business so you can support missions. And I stared at her and I was almost on the verge of tears because now she really got me. And I said, if only you knew. And she goes, he knows and just walk away. And I just stood there. I was like, did that just happen? That just happened. A woman, total stranger, walked up to me, read me my mail, and then walked away. Whoa. So, like, I have to, I now have to adjust my whole idea of the world and the universe because I just got a whole new data point. Like I said, I've heard of this before, but there's something about when it actually happens to you. Yeah, It's like this whole other thing. And so I thought, well, okay, so my business is going to get blessed. So I guess I need to get ready for that to happen. Like I need to, how would you say, I need to like open my window wider. Like I need to raise my expectations. In fact, it was almost like permission to succeed was what that was. Mm. That's really the biggest thing that I got out of that. Um, and like, well, I guess I need to keep working on that math problem. Now, I don't think I would have. I, I, I actually had to try multiple times for the next three years before I actually figured it out. And I just don't think I, I think I would have been content to draw a picture on a napkin and say, well, it looks something like this, but I it's like, well, Vivian told me this, so I got to get to it. So three years later, I figured it out. Um, in 2018, this was published in Harvard Business Review. It's, 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 it's the math of fractal 8020 is what it is. And it's incredibly useful. And I'm not going to go into the whole, if, if you want to see the whole business side of it, uh, you can pick up my book, 8020 Sales and Marketing. You can read about it or type in 8020 Perry Marshall, Harvard Business Review. There's an English translation that you can read. But, uh, but I, I did figure out the math formula three years later and my business did take off. In fact, I figured out that three days before I met Vivian, a guy reached out to me and he said, you know, you, you know, you told me I should get this guy to speak on Google ads at my seminar. He turned me down. Perry, I think you should speak at my seminar. And that's how I got into the Google ad business, which is how I became the author of the world's best-selling book on internet advertising. And so it's actually really remarkable, but my whole business career is revolved around pay-per-click advertising and 80-20 literally for the last 18 years. And both of those things clicked into place on a Friday night at a music thing when this black lady I've never seen before, like shows up out of nowhere. And so like my whole career turned on that. In fact, I could very easily be like just another freelance guy hustling and doing projects, not a best-selling author, not published scientific papers and, you know, stuff like that. Um, and like your, your whole life can turn on a dime. And 
like I, so what I want to say to your listeners is this is real. I know this is real and you can acknowledge that it's real before it happens to you. You don't have to wait until after. And I think it actually speeds the process up. I think you're, you're more likely to get a memo if you expect that one could come in any time. Yeah. And, and you could get a memo if you volunteer to deliver miracles on behalf of the creator. So I've been yes. doing that. I, I had a miracle happen to me. I was invited into a mastermind where they were reading the book. You were born for this by Bruce Wilkinson mm -hmm. and uh, sharing the miracles that, that were happening in their lives that they were delivering for others. You know, mm -hmm. that wasn't about I want to receive miracles. No, I want to deliver miracles like the pizza delivery guy. And it just starts with asking, you know, just like in Isaiah, uh, where Isaiah was at the feet of God and he's like essentially witnessing a board meeting of sorts. And, yep. you know, here are the angels and so forth that are going to um, deliver some of uh, God's miracles and who's doing what. And there is little Isaiah saying, hey, here I am choose me, send me. And uh, we can all do that. We can all yeah. just say, hey, I'm here. Yes. And, and send me. Yes. And I love the book of Isaiah. There's all kinds of stuff in that book that resonates with me. It's really one of the most beautiful ancient books ever written. And I think in, anybody who has a posture of, okay, I'm available what do you need me to do? That's it. Okay. And it's, it's, it's about as simple as that. Um, now, look, I grew up, I'm a pastor's kid and I could go into the deep end of the pool and I could talk about theology and all kinds of, and I'm a philosophical guy. I, I could do all that. And, and that, that's fun at times. Okay. But it starts with being available and it could even be, Hey, I don't know who you are and I don't know how this works, but I'm available and I'm listening. I'm paying attention. So if you, if you want to get my attention, please get it. I find that request gets answered. I can't promise you when it gets answered. I don't know how it gets answered. I'm not in charge of that department. Some days I wish I was, probably most days I'm better off than I'm not, but yes, 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 yes. And the ways that we can receive these messages or these signs or the, the download can be in different forms. They could be through clairaudience, clairvoyance, uh, through an intuitive hit, through um, a chance meeting, uh, claircognizance, just a, a, a knowing so many ways. And I'm, I'm curious how you've been developing your abilities to re, to directly receive rather than having to rely on others like a Vivian or uh, the, the nearby psychic or, or medium to get your guidance. So every morning, th this is the best habit I have ever cultivated, I believe is every morning when I get out of bed, the first thing I do is I go get my notebook and my pencil. I like mechanical pencils. You use a fountain pen, you can use whatever you want. I do not recommend you use keyboard. Yeah, I use a remarkable tablet. <laughs> okay. Those are fun. Great. But, but I sit down and I free write. And I write whatever comes. If I had an idea in the shower, if I just had a dream, if I'm feeling thankful about pushing the kid on the swing last night or whatever, I just start going. And a lot of times I ask questions and then I write whatever answer comes. And you do not edit, you don't question, you don't try to figure it out. You don't worry about whether it makes any sense or not. You just go. And now probably most people 
um, if they do this for 10 minutes, they're going to start feeling like, wow, this is a long time. You get in the groove of it. I usually need at least an hour. And it's the most productive thing I do all day. And I haven't missed a day in eight years, not one day. It is literally the best practice I've ever cultivated. And everybody kind of knows, like Perry just needs to do his thing in the morning. And then when his armor is on and he's ready for the day, he's going to come out and then he can do things. And I think it's one of the reasons that I can be involved in so many activities and so many fields and endeavors and, and be productive. Um, it, it's, it's not because I insanely work ridiculous hours and up all night. Um, I have a pretty sane life, uh, but it all starts with listening. And what am I doing when I do this? I'm exercising the listening muscle, working that muscle. How about you? How do you do it? Well, what I do is a gratitude exercise. <clears throat> I write down what I'm grateful for in terms of the blessings, what I'm grateful for in terms of, oh, well, it's all a blessing. Let me clarify that. So even the challenges or the things I didn't want are blessings, but I write down what I'm grateful for that I want and, re and, and received. I'm, I'm grateful also for the challenges and the things that I didn't want. And things that didn't go my way. And by uh, documenting those, it helps me to see the bigger picture and mm -hmm. to, um, mm -hmm. to, to be grateful for it. Even if I'm not really feeling it at the moment, I, yeah, um, just the recognition that there is a bigger picture and it's for my, uh, my soul's highest and best good helps me to see, uh, to at least glimpse the bigger picture. And I also write down what I'm grateful for in terms of the messages. And I receive messages in many different forms, clear audience, clairvoyance, uh, angel numbers, uh, synchronicities, intuitive hits, it's visions and prophetic dreams, lots and lots of ways. And as and this is all very, very new for me. Mm. It's, it all started this year on January 22nd, because I prayed to God for a job Mm. I watched a video of Sheila Gillette talking about her near-death experience in 1969. She was on her deathbed after childbirth, and she prayed to God, uh, please let me stay on this planet. Let me raise my kids. Just give me a job. I'll do anything. Please give me a job. And I, I wanted God to give me a job. I've got a successful business and all that, but that was not why I was here. So I, uh, and I didn't want a near death experience in order to, <laughs> to get it. So I get the job. So, uh, he heard me and he, he thinned the veils immediately. And I could see, uh, I could see how this universe works, not in exquisite detail, but that essentially we're living in a, in a simulation, not an Elon Musk style simulation, but a simulation where, the angels, the creator, and uh, other divine and sacred beings can kind of rewrite the script as our, our movie, our life plays out. So, Stefan, I don't know you hardly at all, but if I rewind to you talking about writing scripts and like being a coder, I know an awful lot of people who do stuff like that. And I'm an engineer, you know, and most people like that is a very linear world. Okay. Yeah. And I'm a very linear thinker <laughs> or yeah. have been. <laughs> I'm guessing this was a stretch. It, it was. It, well, it took a, a wake up call in uh, June of last year where one of my family members lives was saved while I was interviewing somebody for my podcast. Okay. Yeah. I know. Weird, right? <laughs> so it was the only interview I did in a three week time period. So again, synchronicity, there's no randomness. Everything is divinely guided and planned. So this one interview I squeezed into a three week time period while I was trying to get ready to move to Florida from LA um, this guy happened to be a psychic medium. 
the only second psychic medium I'd ever interviewed on the show. And while I was interviewing him, my wife uh, comes in, interrupts the interview to slip a piece of paper to me that says, is this person I'm going to keep uh, who it is private for, um, you know, just yeah. their medical privacy. Is this person having a stroke? And his answer, this is Mark Nelson, who, who uh, I was interviewing. Totally legit. He's the real deal. He's like, absolutely, she is. And if she doesn't go to the hospital, here's what's going to happen. And she was not going to go. She didn't believe that she was uh, having a stroke or anything like that. No big deal. So it took monumental convincing to get her to go. And we didn't live anywhere near her. But she did finally go. And we wouldn't have pushed it to that limit if he had not been so insistent that she was having a stroke and indeed she was that is but, quite boring yeah and that cracked open the door around the whole psychic world for me because i wasn't open to it before i had not had any interest in getting a reading or going to a seance i still haven't gone to a seance but you know like none of this uh world was of interest to me prior to june and then I went and had a reading with him again, coincidentally, <laughs> uh, um, synchronicity uh, again hit and we lived 10 minutes from each other. So I was able to go and get a reading from this guy and uh, boy, he nailed it. He knew stuff uh, that he couldn't have possibly known about my mother who had passed. My mother um, communicated through him to me and uh was saying stuff that I'd even forgotten about her. So yeah, that, that started me down this path of, um, well, then of course I interviewed Sheila Gillette and in the preparation for that interview, she channels 12 archangels. And <clears throat> again, she is absolutely the real deal. And, and in the preparation for that interview is where I, I got that um, impetus to pray for a job myself took a few months before I was ready. But when I was, and I was, I, I did it from a place of humility and gratitude and surrender. So in the middle of the night, it was instant. Wow. Well, clearly there was some preparation that you needed to go through in order to get into that spot and then it clicked into place yeah it it, it took it took a while but i think the the journey was the journey to get there from agnostic to uh believing not just believing but experiencing god which happened in 2012 when i was in india and i got touched on the head by a monk and he zapped me it was like an lsd trip hmm. that was um otherworldly for sure and then all these miracles started uh happening for me that were without a doubt signs for me i think about somebody pray for them 15 years of no contact with this person and then they call me out of the blue on their on my cell phone to apologize yeah wow wow yeah so i, I was plugged in but i wasn't fully receptive. I believe in this concept of the willing suspension of disbelief, but I wasn't willing to apply it yet to the whole psychic world. And turns out we're all psychic. <laughs> we all get the intuitive hits. We all get the, uh, the, just the knowing that clear cognizance. And some of us have the ability to see visions and to hear uh, voices, which incidentally, I didn't know this until recently, is usually in our own voice. Yeah. Well, you know, the way I like to put it is not everybody's good at accounting. And some people are a thousand times better at accounting than other people, but everybody can do a little bit. Yeah. Right. Like anybody could balance a checkbook, at least if it was a simple checkbook bound, right? Like um, everybody can hear the voice and some people choose to work the listening ear muscle. 
And some people get an assignment to use that muscle and they, you know, they become prophetic people. Mm -hmm. And so, so yeah. So my number one thing is what I just said uh, is, is the journaling and the listening every morning. And then another one is you become like people that you surround yourself with. And so, um, you know, Vivian was my first one. Well, there's more people where she came from. Did you keep in touch with her? Yeah. Well, you know, what happened was, um, for 10 years, I had no idea who she was and I, I, I saw her one other time and then that was it. I had no idea how to find her. Well, my 80, 20 book, when it came out, the dedication at the beginning of the book says to the master mathematician and to Vivian. And I was like, I, this book is dedicated to some crazy woman that I only met, like, I got to find her. And so I went on an all out hunt to track this person down. And I finally did find her and um, got her and her husband in a restaurant one night. I'm like, Hey, so like, let me tell you what's happened in the last 10 years, It was 10 years later. And, um, and so like, she, <laughs> uh, she's one of my besties now. Uh, we've, uh, I talked to her yesterday um, and yeah, like, so there's that saying, like your income becomes like the average of the five people. Like, well, if you just kind of extend that, if you want to play violin, then your violin playing is the average of like your five closest violin friends. And, you know, if, 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 if you're working your prophetic ear, then it's going to be the average of the five you know, prophetic people that you hang out with, like you can exercise that principle in a lot of different dimensions. And I think it's the ultimate $10,000 an hour skill. And I'm, I'm not reducing it to money when I say that. I'm just, that's a, that's a way of saying this is an incredibly valuable skill. Yeah. And you're talking about the listening. Yeah. To be able to uh, essentially have a conversation with God and not just a one way uh, pleading and, and begging for stuff to happen all the time that you want. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Because if you, if you can clear the channels enough for that to be an actual conversation, you can walk through anything. In fact, I heard a talk a guy gave once. He was in a grocery store parking lot when somebody started shooting. So like he and his girls had come to the grocery store and they were getting out of their car and they were ready to go into the store. And all of a sudden bullets start flying. And um, one or both of his girls got hit and they went down and he heard God say to him, we are going to go through this together. Like in the middle of this insanity in the parking lot. Okay. Now I wouldn't wish that on anybody. And I know he lost at least one of those girls. I, I don't know the story well. Okay. But he had a companion to go through the chaos he didn't have to go through it by himself. Okay. And I don't think you have to go through anything by yourself, whether it's, you know, glory or tragedy or, or anything in between. And, and you shouldn't. But the, th the thing, the way the world works is you get to decide. And my experience is God will respect whatever you decide. If you don't want God in your life, you won't find him anywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's the illusion of separation at your request turned up to, you know, 11 on the dial. Yes, yes. And, and I, think, I think there's a lot of people, they'll say, yeah, where's God when you need him? Like, well, you ushered him to the door a long time ago. 
and he left. So he's not invited in. So you don't, you don't have that experience. Uh, I suspect that there's more people than they realize who have, they've done that. And then they wonder why does the world seem like such a pointless place? Hmm. It's not pointless. Uh, but like, in the, uh, there's actually a chapter in the book of Isaiah. Um, some of the translations call it the God who hides. It's like, hey, you, you ushered me to the door and you're not going to find me. And so like, you know, you can invite him back, but you got to do that. It, and it's, it, it's on you to do that. Yeah. And there's no judgment there. There's no, uh, well, you have to prove yourself. I mean, if you, if you ask with contrition and humility and, and uh, love, it's going to flood in. And God is not a belief. God is an experience. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, yeah. One of, I think one of the great tragedies is that a lot of people reduce God to a set of intellectual propositions. In fact, in fact, I think a lot of um, Christian systematic theology, that's exactly what they've done. And I don't really have anything against systematic theology, but you have to understand that you're only dimly approximating something. You're not defining it. Um, and uh, yeah, wow, fascinating. So what would you tell somebody who's uh, very skeptical? I mean, they're probably not still listening, but <laughs> if they are, uh, what do you tell somebody who's skeptical? Like, well, I've never had a without a doubt sign from the creator or my angels or from my spirit guides or anything else like that. I would say, okay, start with. There are so many people who have stories, okay? I get, this is a book of stories, memos from the head office, story after story after story after story, okay? I know all these people and we meticulously researched this before it went to press and almost everybody, names, dates, places, times, you can go look these people up. There's almost no, no story in this book that's anonymous, okay? I, I would first start with this. Can you really be so bitter and so cynical as to discount every story anybody else tells you? Like, do you really distrust your fellow human being to that degree? Why don't you start with somebody else's story and understand, yeah, this really happened. Like that Vivian story I told you, that really happened. It happened on March 23 or 21, 2003, whichever the Friday is like the third Friday of March in 2003. Go look it up. That's the day it happened. It happened in Oak Park, Illinois. And then, you know, there, there's all these other stories too. There's also a chapter. I, in a, to some degree, I wrote this book for the skeptic. There's a chapter called, Is There Scientific Evidence for Memos? And what I do, and it's a pretty short chapter, but I, I go through about at least a dozen and a half sources that you can go to. Go read this book. Go read the footnotes in this book. Go read the scientific papers that were written about this and about this and about this. There is a large body of actual scientific literature, okay? Not like happy, joy, joy, froofy, feel good, new age books, okay? No, actual scientific literature, Stanford, Princeton University, um, Department of Defense, like there's a whole bunch of this stuff. Do you have any of that on your website for the, the book? Um, well, I don't remember if, well, I, on my various websites, you will find it. If you, uh, I'll give you, I give, give you a Google search that'll turn up some stuff. 
I'll, I'll include that into the show notes for this episode. Um, okay, here, here's one. Perry Marshall, sorry, sorry. Um, coffeehousetheology.com slash miracles. Okay, start there. Um, and there's, there's, there's more in the chapter in the memos book. There's a, there's a book um, called Margins of Reality by John and Dunn, which is the result of the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab, which ran for 28 years. I have a podcast interview on the Evolution 2.0 podcast with Brenda Dunn, who used to run that department at Princeton. And they did oodles of experiments where they proved with five nines of statistical accuracy that people could sense the future, uh, see objects that were thousands of miles away, um, exchange messages with other human beings with, with only like 0.0001% chance that it was luck. Uh, they can sway random number generators by concentration. They can displace falling objects with concentration. And in most cases, these were only small differences. Okay, it wasn't like hailstones were falling out of the air and then they were going back up. Like, I'm not talking about that, okay? I'm talking about small but measurable abilities to affect certain things. Um, and, and so there's a lot of literature about this and it is not, it's not acknowledged in the mainstream media. It's not acknowledged in most scientific journals, but you can go read all of this research for yourself and you could, this research actually has higher standards of proof than most research because it has to, because there's so much skepticism against it. Okay, so if you, you, know, you, if you go look up the repeatability of scientific experiments, by the way, I am a published scientific author. I am on peer-reviewed panels of peer-reviewed journal. I know the science world. Go, go look up my science career because I have one that's going on right now. Um, Most scientific experiments are not even repeatable. Okay, like there's all kinds of medical studies where, you know, they, 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 they do it a second time and it gets a different result. All right. And so the paranormal research I'm referring to, at least some of it, is of a higher grade than a lot of standard medical research. And so speaking to the skeptic, this is real. You can verify it. And I want you to remind you of something. If only one of these stories is true, only one, then there's another dimension that most of us weren't educated about. Yeah. And, it, and it's there not, is a matrix <laughs> that we haven't seen. It's not like this is new. Okay. This is the oldest idea in the world. It's older than the oldest profession in the world because human beings have been spiritual for as long as we have archaeological history of anything resembling a modern human. There's a, there's a great book, by the way. It's called The Penultimate Curiosity by Roger Wagner and Andrew Briggs. Andrew Briggs is a, an Oxford physicist. I know him. And, and he wrote this book. It's an anthropological exploration of the last hundred years thousand years of humans quest for religious meaning and he he correlates it to the scientific questions that that have kind of um been dancing with the metaphysical questions all along the the subtitle of the book is is how how science swims in the slipstream of ultimate questions well you got me started man so, <laughs> and, and uh, is Proof of Heaven a book that you recommend as well by Evan Alexander? Um, I don't remember that book. There's there's a book called Heaven is for Real. I'll, I'll include it in the show notes. And and isn't there a movie uh, based yes. on that? Yeah. Yes, there is a movie by that title as yeah, well. Yeah. 
Awesome. Okay. Well, I know we have to wrap up, but one thing I want to leave our listener with as a to-do is for them to go and ask their family and friends for an example of a without a doubt sign or something that has uh, defied logic or uh, randomness or something that like I've heard so many stories once I started asking yes. of family and friends who have been able to, uh, well, one had an out of body experience they never shared with me. And I've, I've known this, this is a family member I've known for decades. Another uh, family member told me that uh, she was able to predict with the tarot, uh, the winner of the Kentucky Derby this year. Okay. And another, uh, a friend of mine told me that she saw an angel last year. And this is a hardcore business lady who I would never would have guessed. Like this stuff is happening. They're just not telling you about it because who wants the ridicule and right. the uh, derision and all the right. negative judgment? Yeah. Right. You won't have to look far to find it. I promise yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So where does our uh, listener or viewer go to read the book, to learn more from you, to follow you and uh, you know, all, all that good stuff? Uh, Memos from the head office is on paperback, Kindle, and Audible. So you can you can go pick those up at Amazon or wherever you want to buy the book. Um, if you go to perrymarshall.com slash memos, you get three free chapters and you get on our notification list. We have live memos calls that we do from time to time. You actually get on and get a memo if you if you respond to it quick enough to get on the call. So yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Perry. And thank you, listener. We'll catch you in the next episode. This is your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.